подсудимого Иодоля, который на допросе показал, что планы нападения на СССР конкретно были разработаны в ноябре-декабре 1940 года. Нюрнбергский процесс произвел огромное впечатление на современников, пожалуй, даже религиозное. Было поругано зло. Зло было наказано не правом силы, а правом закона с участием судей, прокуроров, защитников, адвокатов. Доказательства были неоспоримы. Дьявол был убит и развеян вместе с прахом повешенных и сожженных нацистов. Люди верили, что это больше никогда не повторится. Люди всегда в это верят. Но складывается ощущение, что развеянный прах, облетев планету, осел и дает кривые, омерзительные ростки. One of the Nazi criminals tried in Nuremberg was Joseph Goebbels, the Nazi German head of propaganda and radio. In his speech at the Nuremberg trials, he said, if you think this is the end, you're mistaken. We are witnessing the birth of the Nazi legend. At the time, hardly anyone could have believed that. One would like to think that these were merely the ravings of a defeated and crushed foe. And they might have been. No one ever repealed the rulings of the Nuremberg trials. Впервые, наконец, в лице подсудимых мы судим не только их самих, но и преступные учреждения и организации, ими созданные, человеконенавистнические теории и идеи, ими распространяемые в целях осуществления давно задуманных преступлений против мира и человечества. In Nuremberg, it was Nazi Germany, its political and military leadership that was recognized as the major and sole perpetrators of international aggression. The trials identified a new range of international crimes, which then became established in international law and in the national legislation of many countries. For the first time in history, Nuremberg identified the Nazi aggression as a crime against peace. And moreover, the officials responsible for planning and unleashing these wars of aggression were brought to justice for the first time. The Nuremberg rulings gave rise to a new branch of international law, international criminal law. This was revolutionary. It was a real legal revolution, a universal revolution of mercy, common sense, and justice. It was of such great import that to this day, no one dares deny the results out loud. However, the results of Nuremberg are being demolished brick by brick, each small part. When did this start? Perhaps it goes back to the very Nuremberg trials themselves. There were 13 Nuremberg trials, not just a single one, as many people today think. However, the remaining 12 trials were carried out by the Americans. It was an American court which tried Nazi doctors and members of the Einsatzgruppen, the units responsible for the murder of Jews and anyone resisting the Nazi regime in the occupied territories. Also tried here were several German industrialists and military commanders. As a result of these trials, 24 individuals were sentenced to death, 118 to prison, and 35 defendants were acquitted. Merely as individuals, their личная судьба обвиняемых мало интересует мир. В чем же тогда важность данного процесса? В 
том, что обвиняемые представляют собой зловещие силы, которые останутся в мире еще долго после того, как их тела обратятся в прах. The Americans had their own interests. Of course, those who were punished were guilty, and they deserved their punishment. But among other things, some forces within the United States soon realized that while the Nazis were sons of bitches, some of them were their sons of bitches, who would prove useful in the upcoming confrontation with Soviet Russia. A sign of this had already appeared during the trial of the owner of the Krupp defense concern that was among Germany's largest. Alfred Krupp was found guilty of plundering the industries of the Nazi-occupied countries and using slave labor. On July 31, 1948, Krupp was sentenced to 12 years with confiscation of assets, but already on February 4, 1951, he was freed. Moreover, the confiscation of his assets was waived, as was the breaking up of his company. Krupp would lead his company again, all the way until his death. Another example. One of the leaders of the industrial group IG Farben and the head of the Reich's war economy, Karl Krausch, was accused of war crimes and crimes against humanity through participation in the enslavement and deportation to slave labor on a gigantic scale of concentration camp inmates and civilians in occupied countries and of prisoners of war. He was sentenced in 1948 to six years, but he was freed in 1950, and he continued to run German chemical concerns. We can go on. Hermann Goering's deputy field marshal Erhard Milk, the inspector general of the Luftwaffe, was found guilty of knowingly committing war crimes by using slave labor in violation of international conventions, laws, and customs of war, as well as using human beings for deadly medical experiments. On April 17, 1947, the court sentenced him to life imprisonment. In 1954, he was given early release. In 1952, Field Marshal Wilhelm List, who had commanded German troops in the Balkans and was sentenced to life imprisonment, was released. His subordinates, who were found guilty of numerous punitive operations in Yugoslavia, Albania, and Greece, and sentenced to 10 to 20 years in 1948, had been released already in 1951. Einsatzkommando leader Walter Blum murdered over 24,000 people in June to September 1941 alone. He was sentenced to 25 years in prison. In 1955, he was released early. That cannot be, you might be saying. Why? The answer is a banal one. The Cold War had begun, and it wasn't us, the Russians or Soviets, who started it. It was a war for supremacy over the world, which was being claimed by the most popular country on the planet, the Soviet Union, which was the world's number two economy, the biggest nation, geographically speaking, and the bearer of the communist idea which was very attractive for all the world at the time. 
What use did the Americans have for the Germans with their soiled reputation? Contrary to what had been agreed at the Potsdam Conference, the Americans began to remilitarize West Germany. In Washington, West Germany was seen as a White House-controlled strike force that could be used against us, and therefore the Americans needed Krupp's defense concern and a new German army, the Bundeswehr, consisting of Hitler's generals, who had already proven their success in killing Russians. Civilization не может позволить себе пойти на компромисс с этими социальными силами. И мы лишь придадим им новую силу, если будем действовать снисходительно или нерешительно по отношению к людям, в которых гнездится зло. Some industrial leaders that the Americans especially needed were not prosecuted at all. Among them were Arthur Rudolph, head of the Mittelwerk factory that had relied on the labor of concentration camp prisoners. By pure coincidence, Rudolf was one of the main developers of the V-2 missile and a valuable man for the Americans, who brought him to the USA, where he participated in the making of the Saturn V rocket and the Pershing missile. Only in 1984, when Rudolf was no longer needed by anyone, did a scandal break out over his war crimes. The Americans punished him harshly for it, yes, by stripping him of his American citizenship and sending him back to Germany. Цветами был окружен кровавый фашистский застенок, дьявольская лаборатория, где применялись новые методы умерщвления. Живые люди здесь были дешевым материалом для чудовищных экспериментов. Их обливали жидким фосфором, искусственно вызывали заражение крови, испытывали на них действие ядов. Конрад Шейфер, who had performed experiments on prisoners in Dachau, was also acquitted. The Americans thought that his discoveries might be useful to them. He was a smart guy and a keen worker. In 1951, he began to work for the U.S. Air Force. The Americans also took care that these tried and trusted individuals would retain their positions in West Germany's state apparatus. By the early 1960s, a quarter of West Germany's police were former SS. In the West German justice system, there were around 1,200 judges and prosecutors who had served under Hitler and handed down sentences against socialists, communists, Jews, and other undesirables. 90% of West Germany's judges and 95% of its prosecutors had held the same positions as in the Nazi era. Kurt Georg Kiesinger, a Nazi party member who had been a department head in the Reich's Ministry of Propaganda, would later serve as West Germany's Chancellor in 1966 to 1969. Chancellor, ladies and gentlemen. How could one leave an expert like this unemployed? The Secretary of State at the Nazi Foreign Office and SS Brigadefuhrer Ernst von Weizsäcker was sentenced to seven years for his role in the deportation of French Jews, but he served less than three. Serving as attorney for this SS man, Weissacker, murderer of Jews, was his son, Richard. Richard had every reason to be worried about his dad. After all, in 1937, Richard had led a Hitler Youth Division in Berlin. Upon the outbreak of World War II, he was called up into the German army. He took part in the Polish and Russian campaigns and was awarded two Iron Crosses for his services. In 1984 to 1994, this same Richard von Weissacker was the president of West Germany. Bingo. The son of an SS officer, a Hitler Youth commander, and a Nazi attorney. 
The surprise we now feel at the various neo-Nazi trends is, to a certain degree, rather naive. For too long, we have closed our eyes to the obvious. For too long, we were embarrassed to admit that the rehabilitation of Nazism began already as we put Nazism on trial in Nuremberg, thinking that the whole world was of the same mind as us. This rehabilitation proceeded slowly, at times almost unnoticeably. Then many things became ever more clear. Those who are opponents in the Cold War considered their sons of bitches bred and multiplied ferociously. Or, if I may say so, American and other democratic partners who proclaimed to the world that they were responsible for Nazism's defeat were simultaneously using blatantly neo-Nazi trash for their own purposes. Those who remained alive proved a fine foundation for getting started. Let's take a look at the matter. Viewers will forgive us for such a harsh depiction, but we are only stating the facts. In Estonia, during World War II, 90,000 men served in pro-Hitlerite formations. While in Latvia, the figure was 150,000. In these countries, three SS divisions were founded. In Nazi collaborators per 10,000 people, Estonia and Latvia held the first and second places in all Europe. And since 1994, Latvia has observed Legionnaires' Day in honor of these SS divisions' confrontation with the advancing Red Army in the Pskov region in 1944. <laughs> Колхозник Бабич опознал среди погибших двух своих сыновей, Павлика и Шуру. Мы не забудем и не простим. And although the Nuremberg Tribunal found on October 1, 1946, that SS divisions were responsible for a multitude of murders and atrocities in the occupied territories, Latvia's former president, Valdis Zatlers, claimed that the legionnaires were not Nazis. But what are we to do now? What should we do with our memories? We recall that within Soviet territory in 1943 and 1944, the Latvian SS Legion carried out the punitive operations known as Winterzauber and Spring Holiday, in which they killed many civilians. In addition, we must note that Latvian President Andris Berzins awarded a Latvian SS veteran, Laimonis Eizergalis, the country's highest honor, the Order of the Three Stars. Another Latvian president, Valdis Zatlers, awarded another SS veteran, Olgerts Sakers, the Cross of Recognition. Moreover, in the city of Bauska, a memorial was raised to the Latvian battalions of the Waffen-SS. In Estonia, in 2014, Harald Nugisex, a soldier of the Estonian Guard under the Wehrmacht, then a Waffen-SS legionnaire, was buried with military honors. Nugisex had taken part in fighting with Soviet soldiers and as a result was awarded the Knight's Cross. In 2016, a bronze bust of Nugisex was placed at the Laupa School near Turi. This happened in the same Estonia where, after the Wehrmacht occupied Tartu in the summer and autumn of 1941, Omakaitse units killed more than 12,000 civilians and Soviet POWs.
Nor can one pass over the blatant realities in Ukraine, their torchlight processions, the cult of Bandera and Shuhevich, which they have introduced into state education, their prohibition of communist symbols in the very flag which was once raised over the Reichstag. In 2008, a whole monument was erected on the Zhbir mountain outside the village of Yasinov near Lvov, at the site where the 14th SS division, the so-called Galician, fought. In Lvov, a special parade is held each year on April 28th, on the anniversary of this division's founding. And there are streets named after the division in Ivano-Frankovsk, Ternopil, and other cities. Here's an illustrative example. In 1983, John Demyanyuk was sentenced to death in Israel after being charged with the murder of at least 27,900 Jews in the Sobibor concentration camp during World War II. However, his defense launched an extraordinary appeal, and Demyanyuk was released after serving seven years. He returned to the United States and received their citizenship. This is awfully reminiscent of the events following Nuremberg, isn't it? On November 6, 2019, in Ivano-Frankovsk, a memorial plaque was unveiled to Hauptsturmführer Dmitry Paliev, one of the organizers of the Galicia SS Division. Memorial plaques to Paliev have been set also in Lvov and in his native region, in the village of Pirebazets. Not so long ago, Herson's mayor decided to remind residents of one of the founders of the modern Ukrainian state. Billboards appeared in the city, depicting the proclamation of the Ukrainian state, which had been published in Nazi-occupied Lvov on July 30th, 1941. This proclamation contained the following words. The newly formed Ukrainian state will work closely with the National Socialist Greater Germany, which under the leadership of its Führer, Adolf Hitler, is forming a new order in Europe and the world. The Ukrainian People's Revolutionary Army, which has been formed on the Ukrainian lands, will continue to fight with the allied German army against Muscovite occupation for a sovereign and united state and new order in the whole world. If this is some kind of joke, it is a monstrous and vile one. But the worst thing is that they keep retelling this joke time and time again. Let's ask a simple question. If it had not been for the USA and its secret support, could such things have arisen in the Baltic states, in the countries of the former Warsaw Pact, and in Ukraine? No, we can answer bluntly. These things could not have happened. All this rhetoric, all this overt neo-Nazi foulness would remain mere chatter among some poor and miserable swastika-tattooed folk. But they have got cover. In statements in which the United States continues to hold up the Nuremberg trials, it blackens out Soviet Russia's contribution, the Russian people's contribution to victory. In Israel, at a Holocaust observance ceremony on January 23, 2020, American Vice President Michael Pence blatantly failed to mention the Red Army's liberation of Auschwitz. The White House Press Service published on its blog on May 8, 2020, on May 8, 1945, America and Great Britain had victory over the Nazis. America's spirit will always win. In the end, that's what happens. 
The American president can allow himself to say that it was America who defeated, we quote, Nazism and communism. That is, both Nazi Germany and our country. Today, they are teaching the people of their own countries this information. Tomorrow, they will teach our children. We must realize that Nuremberg is not just a historical event that took place several decades ago. Nuremberg is the reality right outside our window. Nuremberg is not just a chapter in a history textbook. It is a challenge that confronts us. Having beaten Nazism once, we have no right to cede our position. Otherwise, the new order will return and devour us.